Hello, and welcome back to the Formal Review. Today, we'll be having a very special episode. Now sit back, maybe grab a drink, and let's talk about this movie. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Formal Review. This is Season 3, Episode 35, and I thank you all for joining me once again. Now, today's episode is the ninth in the monthly look back at history series. Now, in each of these episodes, I, along with a special guest, look back at a very important moment in history, and we usually discuss everything that surrounds the importance of that event, along with a connected film. It may be the creation of a comic book character, or a holiday, or a significant moment in a war, or perhaps something completely different. Each episode will be different. However, listeners will never know when in the month that this episode will drop. They won't know the topic, the film, or who will be joining me. So the only way to find out what film we're going to be talking about in this series each month is to follow me on social media to see when the newest episode is about to be released or just subscribe on your favorite podcast service. Now, today is November 1st, and it does mark a very significant event in history, especially after we just finished doing the Halloween series, because today is Dia de los Muertos and also known as the Day of the Dead. So as such, me and a special guest will be looking at the 2017 Pixar film Coco. Now, before I go into that movie, you know I talk about this at the end, but the data shows that most people skip over that part. <laughs> so I do want to reiterate the importance of leaving reviews on your favorite podcast service because those reviews really help me grow and improve. A lot of you have talked to me offline, but I do really appreciate the reviews that are already are out there if everyone could just continue doing that or letting me know any way that you think that I could grow and make this more entertaining feel free and I'll look at them and I'll grow as such this film was only released a few years ago so there's a slight spoiler warning that comes with this episode though in short though if you don't want to hear the full discussion you care about spoilers and whatnot I would definitely suggest going to watch it then come back and hear our discussion on the film we're also going to be discussing our favorite animated movies of all time and then also our top Top three Pixar films. So stay tuned. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions like, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps that people like to listen on? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every single one of those questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing my podcast. And best of all, it's absolutely 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with some great sponsors. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So if you've always wanted to start a podcast and make money doing it, go to anchor.fm forward slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters all already using Anchor. Again, that's anchor.fm forward slash start. And I can't wait to hear your podcast. Now, I would like to welcome on my guest, who is a good friend of mine from college, Erica. Hey, Erica. How's it going? How are you? It's going. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Thank you for coming on. I do appreciate you joining me. So my listeners get to know you a little bit. Why don't you tell people who you are and your background and everything? Well, just a little bit about me. I'm actually half Mexican, half Honduran, but I was born in Mexico and was there until I was five and I came here. And then when I was a little bit older, I went there back for two years. And then since sixth grade, I've been here. You know, now that Halloween is coming, um, everybody's all excited about Halloween. But for me, what I'm really excited about is Dia de los Muertos, which is a holiday that we really honor and celebrate in Mexico. I'm starting to gather everything up in order to do my ofrenda, which is basically a little table with my family who has passed away, including pets. And, you know, getting everything ready so I can start decorating a few days prior to the start of the holiday. So when you were growing up, was there anything particular or unique to you and your family that you've now as an adult, you're kind of continuing on and that you will eventually pass on to your children? So basically what you see in the movie is what we usually do. It's a little bit more difficult here in the United States, especially if we don't live in an area where there's a lot of Mexicans. For example, I grew up in an area 
area that was mostly other Latin Americans, Colombians, and Hondurans, and they didn't really have the materials that we needed. We had to travel pretty far away, like an hour, hour, two hours to even get the materials like the flowers, the skulls, the different candles that we use in order to do our ofrendas. But now that I live close to an area that has a high population of Mexican Americans and other Mexicans, I'm able to get these flowers. I think in English it's called the marigold flowers and also bread. I don't remember if in the movie they show the bread, but there is a specific type of bread that we eat that day or not eat, but we put it on the ofrendas. It's called the translation is bread of the dead. So I'm able to get that easily now. Other traditions, <laughs> I will say the depletion of the chancla. That's always been practiced, I think, not just in Mexican household, but any Latin <laughs> household. And I will hate yeah. to say this, but most likely <laughs> if I want to just tell my kids stop doing, it's just going to come out of habit and just use the chancla, but not actually hit them because I do it with my cat. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't even like hit yeah. her. I just grab my shoe and I'm like, stop doing that. And then she will just run yeah. away. <laughs> that's funny. So yeah, that's really cool. And concentrating more into movies and obviously this being like an animated movie. Generally, what are your favorite animated movies of all time in no real particular order? That was really tough because there's so many good movies, but I will say like top three is Lion King. Of course, everybody loves Lion mm -hmm. King, Mulan, and Tarzan. I've never been the type of girl for princess movies. I'm not really like a girly girl. So those kind of movies I never really understood just based on like the message it gave me. I know all the girls are like, oh, I want to be a princess, but I wanted something different. And I think mm -hmm. Mulan showed that, the power of a woman or a girl. Lion King, the message behind Lion King was great. And then Tarzan, I just thought it was a great story. Mm -hmm. uh, just quick side tangent. Have you watched the live action stuff yet? I started watching The Lion King. But I had to stop, mm -hmm. to be completely honest, because they took away a lot of the most important quotes, in my opinion, that it's not the same. So I didn't finish the yeah. Mulan. I haven't watched it, but I know that they also took a lot of the things that makes the movie, in my opinion, a great movie. And then Tarzan, I don't know, is there yeah. a real life one? There's been live action versions of Tarzan, but it's not a Disney Tarzan. I will say with yeah. Lion King, I agree. It, it's pretty boring, honestly. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of issues that I have with that movie. And I will say Mulan, it's not as bad as a lot of people think. If you go in thinking it's not the same as the cartoon, it's definitely different. But they took away. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, they take away a lot of things like that. And I would say it's, in my opinion, one of the better live action Disney films. But it's it has issues. But it's not too awful. I wouldn't say it's as boring as Lion King. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So mine are actually outside of Disney. When it comes to animated movies, my Batman nerd comes out and says, Batman Mask of the Phantasm. And then it goes into then my Japanese side, which is, I would say, Grave of the Fireflies and then Ghost in the Shell. They're more adult. <laughs> so it's kind of a little bit different than Disney movies, but... I really enjoy them from what they push toward sci-fi and Grave of the Fireflies is a great World War II movie. Have you ever heard of that one? No, I have not. So it's, yeah, it's a Japanese anime that basically deals with the atomic bombs that happened and these two little kids that have to survive post a lot of the bombings that happened. So it's pretty powerful. I'd recommend you watch it if you haven't. And, Where um, do you usually, yeah. can you find that in like Crunchyroll or in different apps? I know Disney Plus, no, I think it's HBO Max that has a lot of the Miyazaki movies. I just don't remember if that film is on there or not. But let me see. I can actually look because it may be out there on some streaming service that I don't know of. Or it may not. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's on any, like without purchasing it, that is. Oh, it looks like it's on Hulu, actually. Oh, it is. It's actually it is. All right, so yeah, it's on Hulu. You can watch it there. 
it's, it's a bit of a sad movie, so I wouldn't watch it if you're feeling down already. Or pregnant. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it depends on how, I guess, emotional that you are when it comes to that. I don't know, honestly. Uh, so... <laughs> It's a good movie, so I would watch it, but it's definitely a powerful one. But now going on to Pixar, because Pixar, just what they've done so much when it comes to animated movies, they've done obviously so many. But before we go into our favorite Pixar movies, so for so my favorite thing about Pixar is that the really good ones can be both good for kids and adults because they have the pretty colors and funny characters for kids, but then they have important messages that can lead to important conversations for adults to enjoy. And then there are the jokes in there that only adults will get and and kid kind of won't understand it. The adult and kid friendly at the same time. That's one thing I really loved about Pixar. What about you? Yeah, I fully agree with that. I like the message that every Pixar movie has. There's always a beautiful message. Even if they're sad, like up, it just shows the true emotions behind life, mm -hmm. basically, and gives you some life lessons. And I do also enjoy the jokes here and there that adults will understand and kids are just like what <laughs> i really do enjoy that and also the animation is just beautiful for yeah. its time it's not too computerized even though it is mm -hmm. but they do put a lot of effort to make it as real life as possible right i agree so you give your favorite pixar movies and if you want you can give maybe two or three honorable mentions if it's too hard to I'd narrow it down to three well, of course the first one is coco Finding Nemo, Toy Story, and Up. Those are mm -hmm. the four top ones that I really enjoyed uh, watching and remember quotes from them. And I think the most one that resonate with me with the message is Coco, because of course, it reflecting my culture and showing people like the beauty of Dia de los Muertos and Up, because unfortunately I did suffer a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. So first parts of the movies, unfortunately, spoiler alert um it's seen how these two kids meet grow up together end up getting married and unfortunately she suffers a miscarriage and you feel the emotion behind it and i think that was beautifully mm -hmm. depicted by pixar and how they just made that sad moment into a happy moment where the two just stayed together and just thought of the mm -hmm. different adventures so Mm -hmm. That's Those are the four ones that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. We actually have some overlap. So I would say like my honorable mentions were Incredibles, Up, and Toy Story. But my number one, I, that's why I was actually really looking forward to talking about this, is Coco as well. And I'll get into really why in a little while. But I think the two and three that I go back and forth is Inside Out and Wally. Wally mostly from a science fiction fan and... And also the comment that it makes on society. That movie has slowly gotten better as I've watched it more. And it's one of the few movies that for like the first, I don't know, significant amount of the movie, there's no dialogue because it's just Wally kind of going around and then interacting with Eve and stuff. But Inside Out, I personally really like it. Another similar reason, it's obviously teaching about emotions. But the main connection that I have for that movie is the main kid that the emotions are living in she moves from minnesota to san francisco which is something that i went through as a kid as well where i moved from minnesota and a lot of the things that she was excited about as a child i had a lot of similar things and moving to a whole new state and there's a lot of emotions that go with that and that's why i really attached myself to that movie a lot but so now going into the movie it is based on our original idea by Lee Unkirk and is directed by him and co-directed by Adrian Molina. The film's voice cast stars Anthony Gonzalez, Gail Garcia Bernal, Benjamin Bratt, Alana Ubach, Rene Victor, Anna Ophelia Regia, and Edward James Olmos. The story follows a 12-year-old boy named Miguel who is accidentally transported to the land of the dead where he seeks the help of his deceased musician great-great-grandfather to return him to his family among the living and to reverse the family's ban on music. So 
as we mentioned at the beginning, the concept for Coco is inspired by the Mexican holiday Day of the Dead. They began animation in 2016, and Unkirk and some of the crew went to Mexico to do research on this film. And then it was also composed by Michael Giancchino, who also had worked on prior Pixar films. And with the cost of $175 million, Coco was the first film in a nine-figure budget to feature an all-Latino principal cast. So what I really liked about the movie one is the fact that the creators of this movie actually went to mexico and emerged themselves with the mexican culture and asked people and they actually had mexican americans and mexican consultants uh, which is i think very important especially nowadays with trying to depict the culture in a respectful way and i really respected the fact that they did that i think they spent i might be incorrect but a year i think where they went was oaxaca which is beautiful oaxaca is one of the states in mexico that is so rich of our culture it's not as americanized because if you do go to other states in mexico they're very americanized where you can see that they have lost a little bit of their traditions but i think oaxaca since they have so many indigenous people still there um even they speak nahuac which is one of the native languages that from the Aztecs uh, my grandmother actually spoke that language for her you know dialogue so they still have all that traditions uh, that date back all the way to the Aztecs so just by them doing that they were able to see the culture and they depleted it in a beautiful way in Coco the colors the mercado when you first see him running to you know do his job to polish shoes you see the people outside in the market selling the fruit and vegetables in the alebrijes and you see people playing the guitar you see a mariachi band there that's actually what you do see in these small towns and also in bigger cities you do see the mercados and everything but what brought a lot of back you know beautiful memories is the papel picado which is the things that they have hanging out of the of skeletons and like different mm-hmm. drawings on them that just brought back beautiful memories of when I was in Mexico because not only do you see it there, uh, that for Day of the Dead but you do see it for major Mexican holidays mm-hmm. so that's what I really liked about the movie I liked everything similar to what you said I knew some of the stuff about it and that one thing like obviously I loved about this movie was the little things and I mean I'll go into an a little bit the whole the message of the movie but I think I remember learning about Dio de los Muertos either back in elementary school or middle school somewhere early on so I kind of knew little things here and there and that's one thing that I loved about doing this is that I personally learned some new things so when I've rewatched it in preparation for this it was interesting to kind of see how the movie gives via like small lines of dialogue here and there the small history into the holiday and kind of giving viewers more knowledge about the holiday and if you don't know the holiday this movie can and you can tell me if i'm wrong here but can show a a small background into what this holiday is and what it means and i think that to me was a really good aspect of it which i think you said comes from the going there and immersing themselves getting consultants that had more knowledge than them and being able to do their homework in a way to give a accurate representation of it and even as a non Mexican I appreciated that and I think that's something that I will say about the Mulan movie that they didn't do (laughs) and that is one of the problems with that movie and I think a lot of little things it kind of was able to keep things positive even though it's obviously dealing with death which obviously can be a very dark and kind of sad topic to talk about no matter what culture you're in and this movie feels very colorful like you said and for the most part very lighthearted. but it's also dealing with a lot of adult themes of passing on and how do we prepare ourselves for that and how do we keep the memories of your old family members alive and it's interesting to watch this movie because one thing that I've noticed the past few times that I've watched this movie is how when you die that's kind of the age that you end up being the skeleton and what was really interesting that I noticed was with the family members as they moved on and this is something so small that 
I could be analyzing it too much, but how Imelda, I think her name was, the first woman, she died somewhat young, and then like everyone else kind of it got older and older, which is interesting given like the time period because Coco, when she died, she was, I don't know if they actually said, but you could maybe guess maybe 90 plus. And it was really interesting to see that. And then when you go back and look, there's one time where a mother skeleton is walking her little child over the flower bridge. And it's such a small thing like that, but it's kind of, when you really think about it, it's kind of dark, but it's also a premature thing to deal with. This way keeps it very lighthearted. And that's something that if you go into Miyazaki, which is the Japanese anime that I talked about earlier, that dealing with death is such a hard thing to do. And I think they were able to do that really, really well because they're able to add just like a lot of different comedy and just little bits here and there, how when they have to cross over into the real world, there's immigration (laughs) which is I thought was such a really funny thing way to do it and which is really interesting given how especially now immigration is kind of this really intense process there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through and it can be kind of looked at as a very negative way and then obviously a lot of other things that you could go into on that but how they portray immigration is almost a happy thing to go through welcome back anything to declare some churros from my family I won't if you're experiencing travel issues, agents at the Department of Family Reunions are available to assist you. Oh, your photos are in your son's ofrenda. Have a great visit. Gracias. Gracias. And remember to return before sunrise. Enjoy your visit. And then the music is obviously fantastic and there's other like little details about the movie. It's something that I think the more I've rewatched it, the more I've really noticed things about the movie and it's kind of gotten better over time. So, but if there was anything about the movie that I didn't like, and this is still my number one Pixar movie but there's still like two things that I didn't really like and it still kind of bothers me but it's me nitpicking honestly is the cat spirit animal that shows up at the end and it basically obviously gets rid of the, the main antagonist why didn't they just do that from the beginning I don't know like why did they try to do this sneaking in to the concert or whatever I mean I, for story purposes I get it but for like an overpowered creature like they could have easily just gone up and Yeah, and then the extremely, I guess, intense coincidence of the grandfather uh, finding the one random kid who just happens to be the one that could take his picture to his actual friend up (laughs) with the amount of people that live in the land of the dead. It's really stupid, I'll admit. Um, it was. It's just too far fetched yeah, to it's, this just, is, like you said, yeah. believe Say that, that one in whatever billion or trillion people he runs into, Miguel. Yeah, I mean, and again, nitpick doesn't ruin the movie at all for me. But it's just I noticed that this time around when you think about it, with the amount of people that celebrate Dio de los Muertos, he finds the one kid that can help him so easily. But if there was anything, was there anything that you didn't like about the movie? I will say the one thing, and this is just me being nitpick as well. You have the different levels of the community and the lowest level is of the people who are getting forgotten. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really like that just because I thought about all the people who die in accidents and they lose basically their whole entire family. So you're saying those people are forgotten and that they were not going to get you know, Franda's done. So one thing in the Mexican culture is that we grow up talking about death. It's part of life. You ask any Mexican, they're like, yeah, if I die, I die. There's, it's not a big deal. I lived my life. That happens. Yes, it's sad. But that's one thing that I notice is a big difference between Mexicans and other cultures. And I think it's because of the Day of the Dead that since we grow up talking about death all the time, that it doesn't mm-hmm. fade us too much. But just that part of the movie where you have to have a picture of someone in the ofrenda in order to really have them and come. I don't know, it didn't sit well with me because I always think of what if they didn't have a picture of the family member, but they're still talking about them or they think about them or their com- or their community. So that, like I said, it was just being just more being nitpicky about that Mm -hmm. that overall the message is there and it's a cute message but 
they could have just not added that. But I feel like yeah. also it's part of the story. Yeah, I see what you mean. How I was looking at that part was for its attempt at telling a story about the systems and such. You have a system of rights that some citizens have. If somebody has a Patron de Ofrenda, they are allowed to go across into the world and then get gifts, which then essentially becomes their currency when they come back to the land of the dead. And it's really interesting how that's a way of even looking at the privilege of the land of the dead. This then leads to a social and economic class system that exists in the land of the dead. And then there is this misleading system of hope that can, I guess, make you think that you can actually get to where you need to be and actually be quote unquote more famous even in the afterlife. But the system is somewhat broken because the only way you could do that is if someone deems you worthy like in a talent show or you know the right person who can get you into the more exclusive setting. So I think this one also comments on the idea of us versus them in the way of looking at the class system because you can kind of have how this world is essentially we have the rich, we have the middle class, and then we have those living in poverty and you have those that that look at them either with mocking or uh, pity or just straight up hatred and disregard. And this kind of leads to them living in a worse off area. And it's basically an allegory about the system that people in populations that are normally disfranchised have to deal with the system that is just kind of forced to be against them. The privilege is here is having so many pictures on ofrendas so that you would never be forgotten, thus you have more wealth and all that. Whereas people like Miguel's family who are just getting they essentially look down on Hector who is representative of those living in poverty and it's based on rules that really at the end of the day could affect almost anyone no matter the class just it may affect more than others if a photo gets knocked off the friend that they no longer can go that it's something so simple that could affect anyone and yet there is this class system of inequality that really is systemic it affects everything about your life, where you live, uh, whether you're in the downtown or in Ernesto's palace or the slums living with the people who are just about to be ultimately forgotten. I will say, though, it wasn't the best way to do it. So I see what you mean. So the next question you kind of already answered already. But when it comes to the accuracy of this movie, based on what you've already said, it seems like this movie is pretty accurate to what you have celebrated Mexican culture in general right what you mean so that kind of goes into the next question of like yeah, I, think the yeah. Only, I don't remember if they mentioned it in the movie or not but dia de los muertos is actually in some places a three-day celebration in other places it's a two-day celebration mm -hmm. so i don't remember if they mentioned that because it seemed like it was just one day but I know in different regions, they celebrate, each day has their meaning. Like the first day, if you do celebrate the three days, the first day is basically every child that was not able to get baptized, you mm -hmm. celebrate they're called the day of the innocent then the second day you celebrate those that got baptized but died before the age of 12 and then the third and last day which i think is day of all saints dia de todos los santos is basically celebrating everybody else who died in accidents or old age or anything like that but it it varies in regions so maybe just to make it simpler they just said it was just a one day celebration but i just wish they would have mentioned a little bit of it in the movie but other than that they did talk about family do coming we do believe in that that at midnight you have to have your family member's favorite dish for my grandmother when when she passed away i knew that she loves coffee and my mom will always have a cup of coffee with sugar <laughs> and the 
also our cat passed away. And we, that's one thing I don't remember if in the movie they actually have pets in the ofrendas, but a lot of Mexicans do put up their pets. So for mm. us, when our cat passed away, my mom always puts like a can of her favorite food mm. in, in her picture. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, that's like you said, that with going in and immersing themselves is trying to be accurate in the best way. So my fiance told me that her dad, who's a pretty big guitar player, he was paying attention to how they were playing the guitar and like the animation of how the fingers moved. And even that, I mean, this is obviously not dealing with the accuracy of Dio de los Muertos, but even that is such a small detail that is accurate in this movie. And to could be that detailed and that amount of effort that gets put into just a guitar thing. I mean, that shows how much detail they wanted to go into or as much as they could and still have a cohesive story that wasn't like a documentary of going into explaining the holiday. And that is obviously that shows the dedication of the filmmakers of this movie. So when it comes to the messages, what would you say your favorite message or quote of this movie is? There's a clip in the movie that I think it was Miguel that said this. We we may have our differences, but nothing is more important than family. For my family, that's what I always was taught. Family comes first, no matter what. Family will always be there. Family is the people that you will love and support and care about, uh, no matter if you don't get along or you hate each other. But if someone needs your help within your family, you help them without any questions asked. And I love that the movie did show that too. Like with the grandmother, she disagreed about having music and everything, but Miguel still loved his grandmother and still respected her. Yeah, funny enough, that's actually, I would say, the exact same thing. In a similar way, um, when it comes to family is for when I was growing up, it's just knowing where you've come from. So everything. Obviously, you like respect your elders and everything. That was something that my mom always pushed on me. And it's just Japanese culture. I mean, it's very traditional in some ways. And that's something that you have to understand if there are cultural norms and that's because of what family means and even though like with me obviously I'm only half Japanese it's still part of who my family is and I need to understand that and it's a little different obviously from you know, your point of view but it, in the same way that's why I really love that aspect of this movie and I think that's something that honestly can go cross cultures you and I are obviously come from very different backgrounds but we both like that message of the movie so when this movie was released it won Best Animated Feature and Best Original Song, both of which I personally think is still hold up. It has 97% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes based on 342 critics with an average score of 8.3 out of 10. The general consensus states, quote, Coco's rich visual pleasures are matched by a thoughtful narrative that takes a family-friendly and deeply affecting approach to questions of culture, family, life, and death. And on Metacritic, the film holds an 81 out of 100 based on 48 critics indicating quote universal acclaim so from your point of view when it comes to movies like this what would you say is the most important reason to have movies that show the importance of important holidays to specific cultures and showing cultures in um, like a positive light well, I think it's important, especially in America, because we're such a diverse country. Unfortunately, we're right now in an atmosphere that there's a lot of tension, but mm -hmm. I feel that the majority of the people in this country do embrace different cultures, do want to learn about them. And back in the day, people will tolerate certain cultures, but I feel we're moving into more of an era where people are trying to embrace other cultures and see the differences and, and celebrate those differences. Like I said, there's just a lot of tension right now, which get overshadows this. But before all this happened, you know, before 2016, <laughs> there was a lot of movement forward. And if you have different films like Coco, it just shows the beauty of that specific culture that they're talking about in their holiday. I just wish there were more. I think Coco might have been just the start of this mm -hmm. but 
I know there's been a lot of pushback from a lot of people, and there were some Latinos, not just Mexican, like Latin Americans in general, that were pretty upset about the movie. And it was more because they feel that they are taking away the culture in a way. I know that Disney tried to patent Dia de los Muertos, and there was a huge uproar about that. And I feel that, yes, it's important to show all these cultures and all these holidays in a respectful way, but not forget that these holidays are still not part of an American holiday. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. And it really, really bugs me because maybe it's part of my culture. But whenever I hear some of my friends say, oh, are you going to celebrate your Mexican Halloween? And when I hear that, it just, oh, my skin. <laughs> I have to educate them and tell them that that's not a Mexican Halloween. It's a mm -hmm. completely different tradition. Yeah. So I just don't want that to happen to other cultures. I completely understand that. Yeah, I, honestly, I forgot about that Disney tried to do that. That was weird, to say the least. <laughs> I get why people were upset about that. Yeah, because um, you're trying to put money on a culture. It's not American. Yeah. I don't know. It's just like saying Chinese New Year. A company tries to patent that. That's just wrong. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the only way I could give, I don't know, say a certain time of year, they brought in selling things that you would need for holidays. The fact you had to drive as a kid hour and a half to get supplies for a holiday like this. You could show maybe support is that also while selling all the Halloween decorations at every store. And one the thing that... Oh, oh, bad. Sorry, just the one thing that when this movie came out and I was talking to other Latin American friends, Mexican friends, we did agree that if you're going to make products to target, you know, people who do celebrate Day of the Dead, it has to be companies that make sure that they're diverse and it's mm -hmm. not all what we say all white wave I know what making all these things no you have to employ actual mexican americans or mexicans who basically their livelihood is this it's just uh building these things like the skulls take a lot of knowledge and different colors and mm -hmm. the alebrijes there's a certain way that they make them that it should be mostly mexicans doing this when i had to buy a lot of the, the items for my ofrenda because now that we have a house i want to do an ofrenda as like big as my mom's um mm -hmm. i wanted to find actual mexicans who made the stuff and it's very difficult because whenever you google or you go on ICSI or go to amazon it's always these companies that don't have to do anything with mexico and right. they don't need like give some of the profits to help, I don't know, charities or anything like that for Latin Americans. Yes, we do need more stores or more items for us to be able to buy to make our ofrendas, but companies need to make an effort to be more diverse and include people of that culture in the process of making, you know, the items. Yeah, I agree. This film also breaks a lot of stereotypes of how Hollywood has kind of treated those who are typically disenfranchised. People of color in the past have kind of been portrayed in film as these negative images such as drug dealers or criminals. And in reality, I mean, as with all ethnicities, there are people who fall in the stereotypes and as well as people who don't. The problem is, is when there are certain stereotypes being shown for one ethnicity more than another. Now, I'm not trying to focus too much on politics here, but sometimes it is un unavoidable. Now, a certain someone has called Mexicans specifically drug dealers, criminals, and rapists, and I don't find that to be true, and I think this film shows a Mexican family working hard in their shoe family business. They take pride in their work, and it shows as their business has continued on for generations. It also breaks a broken family stereotype that people of color are shown in having a lot. This film does have a single mother being being strong and being the head of the family. Everyone respects her and at times fears her. So she may have had her heart broken, but she doesn't let that stop her. And in addition to that, there is a, another stereotype when it comes to the father character. When there's a single mother, a lot of the dads are being shown to be deadbeat fathers. And the difference I think here is actually a lot of the time he is not doing that. He does recognize his error in his ways, but he tries to fix them and then he tries to go home as soon as he realizes it 
but unfortunately, he is murdered on the way to do so. I agree with that. Outside of this film's ability to break stereotypes, I find that the best part of this movie is how it deals with families and stories in its messages and themes. Um, as I mentioned, death is kind of a hard time to go through, really, for a lot of people. Um, I know that you mentioned that it's something that is kind of in your culture, but I know for a lot of people, it's kind of one of those things that's not as talked about as much. And I think that that's why this movie is able to show how death can be a positive thing. And it's because, honestly, stories are what keep the memory of people alive around us whether that be a tragic accidental death like a car crash or just normal death due to age and these stories don't have to be really about their full life story but certain things can get passed around to just kind of keep the departed around you you remember obviously all the good things and even the bad things you'll remember too and laugh and i think that that's one of the reasons why i really attach myself to this movie because for me personally i lost my grandmother um alzheimer's and then she passed away a few years ago so i'm not really ashamed to say that this movie honestly moves me to tears every single time i watch it alzheimer's is obviously a very tragic um um, disease and can take away someone's memories and while she may not have remembered much of me prior to her passing um i remember her that's why that final scene of coco and miguel is such a powerful scene for me it's a scene of her ultimately forgetting her father and yeah you think about age and everything and yeah that comes into the play of it but as we learned throughout the movie he's not a bad guy he made a decision that was he ended up realizing it was a mistake and um it's really sad that he may be ultimately forgotten and i'm not trying to make this a sob fest or anything but that experience of dealing with my grandmother has really taught me the importance of storytelling and keeping people and things alive and that's really honestly why i started doing these monthly pieces it's such an important thing to keep telling stories and keep educating people about things because if we don't learn from the past and if we don't keep those memories on we can never learn from it and improve and i think that's something what the film kind of went into was how people can always improve you have the old grandmother who had a very she was very set in her ways but then when she interacted with her great great grandson miguel she ended up changing her mind and then he learns the importance of family like we talked about and i think that's another thing that's really great about this movie is how adults are teaching children and children are teaching adults like it's always this learning process going back and forth and how you do that is through these stories and that's why this film really won best original song some of the other songs that year were fine remember me beat out mighty river from mudbound by mary j blige mystery of love from call me by your name stand up for something from marshall and this is me by the great showman now i really like two of those songs stand up for something and this is me now those songs are good but this was one of the first original songs that I think really ties into the plot of the movie. And this was something that I noticed on this rewatch was that Hector doesn't like hearing this song. He constantly says, yeah, I mean, he says when Miguel is at the contest and he wants to sing, remember me, he's just like, oh, don't sing that. And it's too popular. And listening to this because of his connection to the song and how it is meant to be for Coco and how it's kind of become this franchised song toward the antagonist of the film to sing as he leaves the show that he's doing at the time and you can kind of see the distaste for this use of the song because it's supposed to be this love song toward his daughter and each time he hears it he has this sad memory of his daughter that he never saw again each lyric of the song is really about their story remember me though i have to say goodbye remember me don't let it make you cry so he leaves to go on his professional journey as a singer and then he dies again uh, the entire film is about him trying to get back to see his daughter he knows he screwed it up with his wife but he wants to be with his daughter more than anything and though i have to travel far remember me 
Each time you hear a sad guitar. Coco starts to forget her father because she doesn't hear music anymore because of her mother's rule. And then she only remembers him when Miguel plays the guitar. She remembers him and then she is in his arms the next day of Dos Muertos. And I think that that is such a and I think that that is such a great reason of why this movie is so good. So I think it's fairly obvious that i think we both recommend this movie to people to watch do you have any final thoughts on the movie that you want to say just to add a fun fact that i didn't know when i did the research i found out and i thought it was hilarious is with abuelita they had her holding a wooden spoon and carrying the wooden spoon with her mm-hmm. and they later one of the consultants I forget his name but he's mexican-american said well my Mexican households don't really have the abuelita carrying their wooden spoon. It's mostly the chancla. The chancla is what Hispanics fear. Mexican <laughs> households will know. And I feel like the wooden spoon is more, I might be incorrect, but Italian households <laughs> with their nona having the wooden spoon to like hit somebody or, you know, do the whole discipline. But for us, just like the way that they changed it, I think they were halfway done when they decided to change it to the chancla now go get my shoe we do fear the chancla and <laughs> uh that's one thing that people may uh disagree saying oh my god you hit your children with the chancla it's not even like hitting it's just part of our culture and it's mm-hmm. i don't know it we all have a story to tell that unites us mm-hmm. and coco by adding that just made me love it even more this is your first time tuning in. What I always do with a guest is have a set of questions. And this is based on the TV show Inside of the Actor Studios because James Lipton passed early this year on March 2nd. Lipton took his inspiration from the French book talk show host Bernard Pivot, who had a similar questionnaire at the end of every episode on his show of apostrophes. However, it was not invented by Pivot. It was invented by Marcel Proust. I was a big fan of Lipton's Inside the Actor Studio, so to keep his memory alive, I thought I'd have a list similar to his at the end of each episode whenever I have a guest on. Now, I'm not going to keep the exact question here that James Lipton has done. I'm just like he did not keep the exact same questions that Pivot did, but I do want everyone to see where my guest heads at when it comes to movies. So this will be a little bit of fun. So let's get started. Coronavirus aside, because obviously this has gone wonky this year, is how often would you go to the theater to watch movies? To be completely honest, before the pandemic, I didn't really go to the movie theaters. I will wait until they came on streaming services. Then I will watch it. Unless it was a major movie, then I will go. But I will say twice a year, to be honest. So then going off of that, again, coronavirus aside, because it kind of increases the amount for sure. How often do you watch movies at home? Oh, a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I will say at least two movies uh, per month, if not more, depending how busy I am during the month. When you pick a movie, is there an actor or director that will make you watch a film no matter what? Not really. What really will make me want to watch something is how good they do the trailer. If it looks exciting or, you know, funny or whatever I'm in the mood of, then I'm more willing to watch it. But if the trailer doesn't look that exciting, then I don't feel like watching it. But I'll ask it anyway, because I ask everyone this, is do you prefer digital or hard copy movies? Digital. What movie related profession would you like to attempt if you could? I'm such a bad actress and a really bad director, but I guess that if I had to choose, it would be an uh, actress. But, you know, I grew up watching telenovelas, so my thing won't be a little bit too exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what is your favorite movie, or if you can pick one, movie genre? Oh, horror, thrillers, psychological thrillers, all that. Okay. I am a, have a subscription to Shudder, and I love it. <laughs> That's great. 
Now, on the opposite side of it, what is your least favorite movie or movie genre if you can't pick one? Oh, you're going to hate me, and a lot of people might hate me. I don't like the superhero ones. Oh, man. Yeah, I just don't find them. I don't know. I feel like they're boring with all the action, and I think it's just how can you shoot a person multiple times and not even hit them once? It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, it, it's not logical. I, I, I understand that. This one may be a little bit difficult, given your answer to the last question, but best Batman actor. And if you only know one, go ahead and say it. <laughs> I don't know any. <laughs> I do not know. I don't watch a superhero movie, so I don't even know what actor played. <laughs> All right, that's fair. All right, and the next question. Is it biopic or biopic? Uh, biopic. <laughs> if heaven exists... What would you like to hear said to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? The doors are wide open for you. Just kidding. Get ready to see all your loved ones. So that concludes the episode. Erica, thanks for coming on. If there's any way for anyone who wants to talk about and learn more about Dio de los Muertos or Mexican culture or really just anything that we talked about today, how can they do that? On my Instagram is ositabear90. And you can always message me there and I'm willing to teach in Dia de los Muertos as one of my favorite Mexican holidays and traditions and for American Halloween. So, and they come together. So I don't mind answering questions. Great. Well, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks you're for coming welcome. On. It's a pleasure talking yeah. about Coco. All right. See ya. Thanks again. <laughs> yeah. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. What do you think of the movie? Let me know. Hit me up on social media. The former review is on Facebook, Twitter, and the Gram. I post many things, including trailer reactions, so go check those out. The handle is all the same. It's at the former review. Feel free to also check out BackseatDirectors.com, where I work with a big team to put out movie reviews and also editorials. Again, that's BackseatDirectors.com. Please also subscribe to the former review. We're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. We're now on Amazon Music, iHeartRadio. Honestly, pretty much anywhere you can find a podcast, we have our content there. Also, I'm always wanting to grow and improve, so please leave a review and what you want to hear because I really do this for you all. I see the numbers and I really appreciate everyone supporting me and talking to me about movies because frankly, that's what it's all about. And for anyone who has supported me on a financial basis, thank you again. And if you want to help support on a financial basis, please go to anchor.fm forward slash the minus sign formal minus sign review and click support this podcast and honestly any donation is appreciated thank you all again for tuning in and until next time wear your mask wash your hands stay safe and take care everyone thanks for tuning in to another episode of the formal review cheers and we'll see you next time